Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this Q&A. Um, this um, movie, this fantastic movie, has been suggested, recommended by um, one of our students, Jeffrey Lopez. He is uh, majoring in uh, political science, and he is also in our department, Spanish and Latino Studies. So thank you. Um, Jeffrey for for the movie and for accepting to moderate this Q&A. So um, unmute yourself and the floor is yours. Sure, thank you uh, Dr. Galopa for letting me do this. Um, this movie that I saw about two weeks ago was super super interesting and especially in the context of the class that uh, that I'm taking with Dr. Galope uh, about Latin American representation of women in film. I knew that this movie would be perfect um, the movie really explores so many different topics, so many symbols. I could spend like hours talking about all the different symbolism and the ideas that are expressed in the movie. Um, so overall, I hope you guys enjoyed the movie and I'm excited to hear your comments. Thank you. Okay, well, let's start with uh, questions, comments, or anything that you want to say about this film. I was, I was a little distracted. Um, at the end of the movie, did how did they lose the baby? Did they actually take the baby? Someone stole it? And then how did they realize it, realize that uh, the baby was alive? Because I saw they had like the funeral and uh, they started digging at the box. The baby was alive. What, who told them or how did they find that out? Well, there is a, the suggestion that uh, the baby would end up in the United States. In a, in a house with a garden. And so right. obviously it, it suggests the idea of trafficking. Trap, yeah. Well, I think, but, I think yeah. that part, um, go ahead. No, yeah, I missed the part where I, I saw her laying in the bed and they said they forced her to do the signature with the thumb, mm -hmm. the mother. Yeah. But I, I thought the baby was gone until they started digging for the box and realized, oh, wait a minute. And then I thought, well, maybe, you know, and until I saw the guy interpreting wrong, like, oh, wait a minute. They did yeah. something to this baby, but I, that's when I realized it was gone. I, but I was just wondering, how did they ever find out? Yeah, so that just to comment on that, I think, um, I think in the truck, I think the, the dad was referring to Pepe, basically the father of the baby, saying that he was in the house with the garden because that's like verbatim what he said about like having money, speaking English. I think he's talking about Pepe there mm -hmm. because he's referring to, to the masculine he. Um, so then I think that she says, Go ahead. no, no, I'm sorry to, but, but yeah, the, it looks as if they're talking about him, but then she corrects and says, it's a girl. Right. So, obviously, yeah, so I think he's basically like taking the attention away from Pepe because he doesn't even matter. He's not, you know, the essential figure anymore. He's out of their life. So he said, uh, Maria says she is a girl talking about her child and that she won't be able to speak at all because she doesn't she's not old enough to so i think like that's really interesting and when you look at it from a historical context in the 2000s there was a massive problem with uh um human trafficking in guatemala where basically they were you know having all these kids who were supposedly aborted and they were exporting them to other countries and as a result um it's uh, guatemala is one of the foremost um one of the foremost countries where uh children are adopted from which is really interesting so uh, there's some uh, hints to the fact that um, Ignacio was involved and even got money from it because I think even just the fact that he gave the family uh, like a gift of money back, I think that's part of the cut of selling the baby. Um, and it's also something like to the idea of Ignacio doesn't really want to have like a, like a bastard child sort of because, you know, he's very um, fixed on his image and his class. Um, like being the foreman and being the owner of the plantation. Yeah. And in the hospital, wasn't he asking the doctors if she could have more kids? Like, are you sure? Mm -hmm. Like that felt like a concern of his because I, yeah. to me, that sounded like he was kind of possibly plotting for their future mm -hmm. together. Right. Yeah. Also, so even at the end of the movie, they're all obviously getting married to each other, even though she's not happy with it. Um, so I think like it's even symbolic as, as Dr. Galope was saying about like the idea of obscuring her face and you know her not even being able to represent herself. I had a question too, but about what you guys were talking about before about the you know the translation and the language barrier. Um, 
the scene where where the census worker comes in um and she's asking all the questions um and, and then there's an interpreter there who's answering for them i was a little confused because in the subtitles you know like the family is giving an answer like oh three people live here and then the translator goes oh there'll be four and then there was another question about the address and he he seems to know things about like he knows the correct answer but i was just wondering why that was like did he knew their gossip or was he able to intuit something about what they were saying that they were lying well i i think that uh, the translate the interpreter was uh because in the oral medium it's it's interpretation right interpreting the interpreter was the foreman ignacio if i remember it correctly oh okay and, and they obviously um it seems as if that uh, the economic structure of that plantation, the coffee plantation, is that the workers don't own the property. They are allowed to live in their houses, provided that they work, but then as soon as they don't work there anymore, they have to leave. So basically, he is misrepresenting the, the translation. I mean, he's, he's giving his own version because He's not really, that's the first clue that we have that he is interfering in the communication between Spanish and uh, their language. And, and, and he's doing it out of, because he is, uh, well, if he's evil, if he's totally evil, we say, well, certainly because he knows that Maria was leaving him uh, for for Pepe, or would would have loved to leave him, but she couldn't do it because Pepe left her. Um, or maybe because as a as a human character that is flawed and he has feelings, maybe he was also hurt. So uh, there are um, many many um, ways uh, uh, of approaching his behavior, but he's definitely uh, misrepresenting uh, what they are saying. ¿Puedo agregar algo acerca de eso? Sí, claro. Considero que también lo que sucede, a pesar de que ellos no, no eran representados para traducirlos bien, la madre sabía que si ellos decían que iba a haber un bebé, eh, la, de, la social worker, ella iba a tomar acción y entonces ella dijo tres y él dijo cuatro porque él sabía que estaban en una posición que lo pueden, cuando fueran a tener el, el bebé, porque él le contestó, le dijo, no sé qué van a hacer con el bebé, cuando le estaba traduciendo. Entonces después fue como un arreglo, si la, la trabajadora social quizás tomó acción después, cuando nació el bebé, porque en los instintos de ella, la deja, cuando salió del hospital estaba muy preocupada y cuando enterró al bebé decía, yo quiero ver, Yo quiero ver al bebé porque ella presentía que no murió. Quizás en su subconsciente, cuando estaba eh, teniendo al bebé, supo que no murió, pero se lo quitaron porque tenía que ver con todos los problemas sociales en los que ella iba a tener a un bebé. Sí, sí, yo iba a decir que, que en la película obvio que se puede ver que ellos, um, que Ignacio y ella están trabajando juntos. Entonces es muy interesante que que la razón por qué ella decidió hacer eso y tratar de uh, poner el bebé para adoptarse, uno no sabe lo que um, tiene el papel, lo que ellos firmaron, y eso también habla en el, en el sentido que, que nosotros no sabemos qué estaba en el papel, pero ellos tampoco, porque ellos no podían leer. Entonces yo creo que eso es algo muy importante cuando uno está mirando esta película, um, porque es muy, porque podemos estar en el punto de vista de ellos, porque no podemos leer el papel, entonces ellos tampoco pueden. Entonces yo creo que eso es muy interesante. Can you summarize it in English a little bit for those who... Sure, yeah. So she was basically talking about how the social workers seem to have, you know, been involved in the, um, involved in the adoption or human trafficking. And basically the idea that um, even in the beginning when the social worker came in, she was, you know, um, Ignacio had said that there's four people, even though the mom had said that there's three. So it's really interesting, um, especially the idea of us, the audience, not being able to see what the papers were that she signed. And it speaks on the idea that, you know, these people obviously 
cannot read. And so we as the audience aren't able to either. So it's obviously a choice where, you know, there's just a piece of paper and we have no idea what's on it. We have no idea what they signed, but it kind of makes us uh, be in the shoes of the indigenous people. Yeah. Well, one of the aspects that I liked the most in this film was the way in which the director links uh, this cosmovision of the world that has the uh, Maya Kishakel culture with the social series of which Carmen was talking about in her intervention because they are working in an hacienda. It is called in there a plantation, but the plantation belongs to the lowlands where they are uh, cutting the sugar cane, the cacao, and those products mainly. So on the highlands, it is coffee, and that is a, a, the crop. And uh, we see there the exploitation of the families, as Raul was saying. Uh, those are type of uh, feudal characteristics Mm -hmm. of uh, the life in Latin America, especially in indigenous people's community who have been dispossessed of the land. So this is a crucial social problem because the main problem in Latin America is the lack of land uh, for the peasant. Since they have no land, they are expelled from the land, they migrate to the big cities, and from the big cities, they come to the north. I saw the same yeah. problematic in El Norte, a film of uh, the early 1980s, but in El Norte, the uh, social series are a little more mechanically linked to the aesthetic series of the film. While here, it is done through this ritual and it's very subtle and you almost uh, don't see the exploitation in there and you don't see uh, it's as a pamphlet, but it uh, runs very, very, very smooth. It seems to me that is a very good achievement of this film. Exactly. Jairo Bustamante. Correct. Yeah, yeah, I agree definitely. Um, I think, you know, obviously there's a, the issue of class, the issue of latifundio. Um, and I want to thank, obviously, Dr. Soto because he taught me a lot of these things that I was able to explore throughout the film and his, uh, his class perspectives on Latin America. So I think obviously there's a class issue when you're looking at uh, the movie, especially just the idea of um, uh, Manuel, the dad, uh, being like, not really the co-foreman, but kind of, where he's basically the one in charge of, you know, making sure that everyone is getting the weight of the coffee bags and stuff. So he even has to um, tell Pepe, like, you know, you obviously pour, poured water on this to make it heavier. Like, you're not allowed to do that. So it's hitting the same social classes against each other and creating a, um, an artificial hierarchy. So I think it's really interesting, especially when the fact that, you know, Pepe obviously becomes um, his daughter's, you know, like lover and uh, the, the father of our, her baby. So I think it's really, really interesting in that aspect and even just the idea of coffee um, because obviously a lot of the coffee of the world comes from Guatemala. So it really helps international audiences kind of think about where they're getting their coffee from and you know especially people who are interested in the sourcing of stuff like that I think coffee is like a expert rip uh, like an extremely good um, plant to kind of have in a movie like this as opposed to choosing sugar cane or anything like that because coffee is you know is something that a lot of people drink but not everyone drinks so it really allows everyone to know like obviously like you always think about places that produce coffee like Colombia Guatemala and stuff like that I think it's really interesting um, that they chose to have. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And also makes us understand when some uh, coffee shops claim, at least they claim, I don't know if it's totally true, but they claim that they sort of uh, purchase the beans from um, fair trade sort of companies and, and, and so that is also a statement that they try to protect the worker and, and maybe a cooperative type of um, uh, arrangement. So everybody gets a little bit of the, a share of, of the work as opposed to just, as 
Professor Soto, Dr. Soto said, it's, it's almost like a feudal system in which they sort of um, belong to the, the foreman. That, that happened in all Latin America. Uh, in some places uh, at different times, and now maybe there is some legislation against that to a certain extent, I, or maybe it's switched uh, to a different modality, but uh, um, there were, and it, it's, it's registered in literature, like there is a, a, a novel from Argentina, um, the writer, if I remember it correctly, is Alfredo Varela, and the novel is called um, uh, El Rio Oscuro, The Dark River, and it was made into a movie, Las Aguas Bajan Turbias, The Waters Come Down Muddy, and, and it's about the same story, but it's about uh, yerba mate. It's about the, mm -hmm. uh, that green tea that is very popular yeah, yeah. in Argentina and, and Uruguay and uh, all the, the South. And, and, and how the foreman was almost like they owned the lives of the people who worked for, for him. And uh, he yeah. killed them and nothing happened. Yeah. Just to add to that, the idea of coffee has even been used by a lot of leftists, uh, like insurgents and guerrillas. Like, for example, even the Zapatistas have their own coffee that they try to sell, and they use that funds to, you know, help ed to help educate their population. And so, even looking at it from the context of like a leftist standpoint, and you know, these insurgent groups who are trying to bring about progressivism uh, throughout South America and Latin America, they use coffee as something. You know, they kind of reclaim coffee because a lot of the times coffee and sugar and all these things were things that were exported um but they're kind of reclaiming the idea of coffee and making it theirs and helping it help themselves as opposed to them working the land for other people they're working the land for themselves mm -hmm. and helping their communities by doing so yeah um i didn't think about this before until you guys were talking about it but do you think you could draw like a parallel between the fact that america is one of the biggest consumers of coffee, the, you know, the product of Guatemala in this film, and then the fact that the baby, also a product of Guatemala, and possibly ended up in America too. Yeah, like that I might be a stretch, like a, but. No, 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 that, that for sure, especially just the, the symbolism behind what the United States means to Pepe and Maria, it's full of like mystery, but they also know like some small things. And just the idea that, you know, both things were exported is really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because you don't even know what happens with the coffee. Like, it's kind of like, uh, especially like during the Industrial Revolution, um, the idea of having one person work on just one task in the manufacturing process really eliminated uh, the worker from being able to think about the idea of, you know, making a product by themselves and having the product being able to see what they made. So if you have someone that's just making a door handle for a car, they won't feel like they made the car. They felt like they made a door handle. So taking that away really made it so it basically like took away powers from the workers and it made them think that um, that they're just part of a system. They're part of, you know, uh, they're part of the company. They're not really, you know, the artisans that like wood makers and stuff like that were previously where they made their products and could see their finished products. So I think that, you know, even the idea of not being able to see your baby, but even not being able to see, you know, where your coffee goes, both play on that uh, on that idea. Well, this is a very interesting point that uh, Maggie is bringing here because we cannot forget that when uh, President Eisenhower, first Truman and then President Eisenhower at the end of the 1940s and at the beginning of the 1950s, there was a very progressive government in Guatemala, the government of Juan Jose eh, Arevalo and Jacobo Arbenz. And that was a nationalist government. It was not communist. But the US at that time, uh, communism was the main enemy. It was the beginning of the Cold War. And uh, they implemented uh, land reform and that uh, Central America, uh, the United Fruit Company, they were there. And most of the investors were from the United okay. States. So they did like the land reform that the government of uh, Arevalo and uh, Jacobo Arbenz tried to uh, implement in Latin America. And uh, 
eventually they uh, sponsor a coup d'etat in Guatemala. In 1954, Castillo Armas took over, and since that time, there was a very, very strong guerrilla warfare, which lasted for 50 years, until 1996, when the Treaty of Peace at Esquipulas. So they neutralized all that opposition of the guerrilla warfare. But this film give us uh, uh, a door to make this type of reflection about the history of Latin America. Yeah, even uh, in the in the sense of like um, contextualizing that into literature in A Hundred Years of Solitude by Garcia Marquez, we can even see the idea of uh, the United Fruit Company and the massacre that they had against the workers and basically how it's been forgotten about in the novel. And then we can even see this in the idea of, you know, the United Fruit Company, um, you know, has did so many atrocities and the United States just backed them. And even like the idea of during the historical context of it in Colombia, uh, they, the workers were on a strike and the United States sent a telegram to the, to the Colombians saying, if you guys don't, you know, if you guys don't fix this, then we're going to send our Navy in and there's going to be a problem. So I feel like obviously the United States has used its uh, influence both um, through soft and uh, traditional realistic power. So I think it's really interesting to look at it from that perspective, but also the idea of, you know, it's something that we don't really talk about anymore. The idea of these companies, you know, obviously coming in and actually doing atrocities because a lot of the, the colonialism and neocolonialism that we see is through soft power and through culture. Um, we don't really think about, you know, the idea of, companies getting involved in um, in international politics but even with as was the case with Bolivia we can um, Elon Tusk admitted to helping fund the coup in order to get lithium from Bolivia so obviously we can see that it, this still exists it's just swept under the rug by both governments like the United States but also just by even neoliberal governments like Colombia and you know a lot of neoliberal governments in South America as well um, I have a question mm-hmm that uh, incident that took place with the Colombian workers um, protesting, how long ago was that? Because I, I tried looking this up on Google and I got something called the Banana Massacre, but that was like in 1928. Yeah, exactly. That Yeah, that's what I'm referring to. Um, oh, okay. And I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, so then um, in 100 Years of Solitude, Gabriel Garcia Marquez alludes to this. And then uh, through the um, throughout the novel, he basically talked like the entire village forgets what happened. And one of the characters is basically haunted by all these dead people that he saw in the trains carrying all these dead bodies. Everything, everyone thinks he's crazy because, you know, they didn't see this. They don't even know any of the people who died. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other aspects of the film that you would like to comment on or, or highlight? Something that was uh, interesting or, or shocking or, or thought provoking? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. You want to talk? Um, you got it. You got it. You okay. Um, so I really was interested in what was interesting how the movie basically started with like the pigs and how they wanted them to mate. And then later in the film, it goes where Maria is in like um, the like the carousel with the baby pigs, mm -hmm. and yes. I found that very interesting. And then when you guys were mentioning how Pepe was a basically a nickname for Joseph, it like brought me back to like the nativity scene that we see a lot during like Christmas. And I was like, oh okay, this is inter interesting, especially when they're like working at a um, working in a plantation. So I was like, oh, there's a lot of connections here and a lot of symbolism so yeah. yeah yeah for sure i think the pig is one of the biggest symbols in the movie um because in the beginning they have the pig and showing the pig getting pregnant and then there's a scene obviously of maria drinking heavily and getting pregnant as a result of you know of, of getting drunk with uh with pepe so i think the the pig is really interesting um especially how they kill the pig and then the idea that um the idea that um, as soon as, you know, there's, she's taking care of the new pigs, she's still obviously wounded. So her mom tells her, get out of there because you, uh, you might get your scar infected. So it's kind of the idea of maternity again, it appears again, the mm -hmm. idea of her taking care of the newborn pig as if it were her own daughter. Um, so it's really interesting that aspect because I kind of see some symbolism behind 
uh, Maria and the pig, it kind of parallels it. And then it's kind of, this pig is, the new pig is basically symbolizing uh, kind of a rebirth. And obviously, much like Maria, uh, pigs are often seen as like dirty animals and stuff like that, but they're actually really, really smart, very, very interesting animals. And, um, and it kind of symbolizes how there's a lot of misconceptions, especially about the indigenous communities, just like there are with pigs. So I think that um, the pig is one of the most important yeah. animals throughout the movie, as well as the snakes, but even just like the pig that was um, kind of left behind and bitten by the snake as Maria, sorry, the cow. Uh, that was left behind on the trail because it kind of symbolizes how she was left behind too by Pepe when she wanted to go to the United States. So I think the the aspect of animals in the movie is super, super interesting. Absolutely. And the sacrificial animals. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Dylan, you, you wanted to say something? Uh, yeah, I wanted to say something, but I think you guys uh, touched up on it before. Uh, that during the film, like it's crazy because the entire the entirety of the film they look at america like it's like the golden land like it, it's like where everything is and it's crazy because they understand that they probably won't ever get the chance to go there but the baby ends up going there so it's just pretty symbolic in in that sense like, i'm pretty sure the, fi yeah. the film was just like very symbolic all around it had a lot of symbolism yes absolutely and 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 it even um reminds me of uh uh of course, it's it's a totally different uh, work, but the idea of the mountain as something mystic or mysterious that hides something behind, um, it appears also in in a, a classic one of our classic uh, American musicals, uh, South Pacific. If you remember those who have seen or done South Pacific and. and, and High school or maybe in, in college there's this the valley high that that island that is and it has a, a mountain a volcano and and it's the mystic place where all the soldiers want to go um, and they find their loves etc there um, here is also that that idea I think I think because South Pacific is such an American uh, musical I think that probably the director aware of that can use the idea of the mountain and behind the mountain is that golden place that is called the United States, um, myst mystical and, and, and full of promise. And, and of yeah. course, we living in the United States and knowing what's going on with migration and knowing what's going on with the immigrants or those people who try to make it to the United States, especially those coming from Guatemala, coming from Mexico, we know that that promise or that mystical land is, is just a, a construction that in reality it becomes a nightmare. It becomes a land of oppression and a land of parents being separated from their children and being put in jails, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know what happens when they cross that line. Um, and yeah. so I believe that, especially at this time, that is very poignant. The idea of how they perceive that other side of the mountain and what reality tells us about that other side of the, of the mountain. I think that your yeah. director was very sharp in, in, in creating that analogy. And even just the idea of like reversing El Dorado, um, the idea of El Dorado and looking for this, you know, promised golden land or even the fountain of youth. Um, yeah. It's kind of playing on, you know, the reverse, um, like age of exploration sort of, because it's, they're basically, they've lived, you know, in, in these places for since you know the inception they're indigenous people so it's just the idea of you know kind of like the reversal of the age of exploration and them exploring these new things um, and there's even imperialism in their language and you can kind of see the idea of like a lot of their uh religious sort of things that they have they also speak in spanish so it's really interesting to see how you know their indigenous traditions and religion were mixed with spanish over time so I think the idea of Pepe going to seek this newfound land kind of plays on the idea of the age of exploration, but at the same time, it also plays on the idea of, you know, the idea that we know that probably nothing's going to happen and he's obviously going to have to just keep on working, working and working, 
while you know the the people in the film obviously don't think that to the point where even the dad says that he's probably already speaking english he's probably has a big house with a big garden and making a ton of money so i think that's really interesting yeah yeah very good well i have i have a final observation to uh to make uh, first of all i would like to thank uh jeffrey for inviting me and my classes here to this uh beautiful event and uh, when jeffrey drafted uh, his description of this film he mentioned bolivia and uh, i was seeing at the film how the form of composition of this film the barren lands infertility the dark colors because guatemala is supposed to be a beautiful country uh, the eternal uh, spring Everything is green, everything is with flowers, but what we see here is the opposite. Dark tones, mm -hmm. mysterious mountains, what is behind the mountain, and that is linked uh, to the content, to the, uh, uh, the fate of the indigenous peoples of the Americas. And we see this in Bolivia, uh, where the indigenous population is about six million, Guatemala has about six to seven million, it's almost the same. And in uh, Bolivia, uh, the indigenous people took the power. They won the election, uh, they swept the election with a 53% of the total vote. The second to come after uh, the mass, which is movement toward socialism. I mean, it is not a socialist government. It is not a communist government. It is a nationalistic government who believes in private enterprise, but they want that that private enterprise must fit the necessities of the people of Guatemala, mainly the indigenous people. So the indigenous people through the party mass, they took the power. And uh, the second was about 30%, and the third, 14%. What is the problem now? Everyone is scared in Bolivia because they don't know if the right is going to stage a coup d'etat as they did last year. But we have been following the process and we know for sure because of the international observers because of all the uh, news that we have been watching lately, that the elections were clean. Even the Carter mm -hmm. Center was there as an observer, the United Nations, the Organization of American States. So the elections were clean. And uh, the winner is representing the mestizo population and the indigenous population, and also the middle class, poor whites, an enter, entrepreneur, I mean, it's really a big coalition. Uh, and I see that reflected in this film. Uh, that's why when Jeffrey was drafting his introduction, he mentioned Bolivia. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. So I'll just make some comments on that. Um, first of all, it's an amazing analysis, the idea of the colors, the muted colors, especially in contrast with even the idea of, you know, indigenous people and the idea of even the, their flag full of color encompassing everyone um, so I think it's really interesting in that and even just the idea of the actress's expression throughout the entire movie I don't think she like ever smiles and she's always looking very sad over you know obviously her position and her circumstances um, and even I for the poster I even try to take these colors and try to emulate it sort of uh, making it attractive but also having like a sort of like a pale muted sort of type of uh, blue that was on the movie poster um, and then talking about Bolivia, I think it's really, really interesting because obviously this just happened two, like two days ago, three days ago, the, the elections. So I think that, you know, it was a super opportune moment to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even just the idea of Bolivia finally, you know, getting back the, the power that they had, even with, you know, you know, the entire world basically putting pressure on them to try to impose back neoliberalism, I think having a president who, you know, was in charge of finances and economics and had a leftist progressive sort of economic policy is really interesting, especially considering that the entire continent is full of um, neoliberal policies. And obviously in Chile, um, 
with the protests that were going on last year, we can see that the Chicago Boys and Milton Friedman's uh, doctrine of liberalism and austerity measures has failed, even in Argentina with, you know, the IMF debt. So I think it's really interesting that Bolivia has elected someone who represents both indigenous values, but also progressive values, and basically encompassing um, a leftist perspective on economics, when obviously right-wing economics uh, were basically the only thing that was allowed for any colonies, even in Africa. Um, and we can see that that's obviously, you know, something that's starting to change. And hopefully, um, hopefully the president is going to take some measures to help improve the economy that lowered so much during the, the interim president. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good analysis. But I, you mentioned that she, uh, I mean, I want to just t uh, beyond politics, but uh, uh, going into the aesthetics of, of the movie. And yeah, the, the idea of nature reflecting the, the character's moods, that's a very romantic, uh, not romantic love, but romantic from uh, the, the romantics as, as a literary movement, right? It, the idea of nature uh, highlighting, underscoring the feelings. And of course, this was very morose. It was very gloomy. Um, it, it had to be like that. And actually, I, I saw her smile once. Um, and that was when, um, when her mother uh, says, well, you're going to get married when they're arranging the marriage and they have the, 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 the banquet there or the, the mm. feast. And I said, but you have to accept it because otherwise you're going to not respect your husband or your children. And do you really love him? And she doesn't say yes, but she smiles. And that smile is her compromise of accepting a situation because she knows it's good for the family. And, I, I, and, and this is also something interesting that the film shows us how a woman, at least uh, there, there and in many other cultures before or even now, is an object of exchange between families to move up in the social uh, scale or uh, the social ladder. So in a way, um, that's another interesting aspect of the film, the, the idea of a woman, even in, in a different community, but still being like a, an exchangeable object that is arranged between families to, to um, promote uh, the well-being of the whole family. Yeah, just to add off of that point, just even the idea that the only, I think the only line of, she doesn't have any dialogue in that scene, and the only action that she really takes is that smile. So I think it's super symbolic about the idea that everyone's speaking for her. Um, the mom, the dad, all these people are speaking for her, so she really doesn't have a voice. All yeah. she has is her facial expressions, and the smile, which we don't even really see throughout the movie, is, you know, a rare, it's a compromise from her normal attitude and her normal, you know, her normal, like the normal expressions that she has, where she is trying to help her family, but she's also not happy and she's not even able to speak for herself. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, throughout the movie, she is often talked about as an object, as you were saying. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, well, any other comments or otherwise we can uh, probably um, round up. Oh, Maria Jose. Yes. I just wanted Jose. to thank you. thanks uh, Jeffrey and congratulate you, Raul, because of this initiative of being a student who proposes the film, who suggests a film, and there are students who uh, kind of handle the conversation and provide such important analysis from the historical point of view, the social cultural context, the aesthetic of the film. It has been so complete and comprehensive that I am, I am totally impressed by, by your analysis, Jeffrey, and your insights on the film, so thank you so much. And I hope that other students, I encourage them to maybe propose a film mm -hmm. or stimulate a dialogue such as this one tonight. Thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I'm currently working on something with getting uh, like a lot more students involved um, and just, just in general. So be on the lookout for that as well. Yeah. Yes, um, actually, Spanish and Latino studies is, is, is producing a lot of energy and a lot of um, good responses from our students. And, and we really, we, we are so excited about that because 
basically it's uh, that's where the power is right i mean that all your views and your your fresh ideas because you have a lot of fresh ideas and and that is to me that is important uh fundamental i would say in this exchange because education and 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 learning it's a it's a two-way street it's not just an instructor giving you knowledge or or words but it's the exchange the the this sharing of experiences and and i have to say this um latin american latino studies uh, 205 class uh many of you are here today um uh, it's a it's it's a space where we share that energy once a week and and we really enjoy our exchanges so thank you all for being here thank you for um for all your comments and we're going to have this q a available in our uh on youtube our youtube channel another little plug and next wednesday we have career night uh, a very special event so stay tuned it's going to be about teaching and how can we teach and what can we do in education with spanish um with a speaker uh vicky santana will be the speaker for career night so uh stay tuned because uh, i i hope i can see you again next wednesday okay well thank you so much and have a great evening everybody thank you Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Bye-bye.